الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا ان هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين حبيب اله العالمين ابي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد طب القلوب ودوائها ونور ابصارها وعلى اهل بيته الذين اذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا صل على محمد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من عمل صالحا من ذكر او انثى وهو مؤمن فلنوحينه حياه طيبا امنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات اللهم صل على محمد for the love of Abba Abdullah Al Hussein with the loudest of our voices sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad for the love of Imam Sahib Al Asr was zaman arwahuna lahu al fida sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad once again we thank almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us with this great and wonderful moment, wonderful opportunity tonight to celebrate the birth anniversary of our beloved mother, Bibi Zainab bint Amir al Mu'minin, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayha. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Our felicitation, first and foremost, goes to the Imam of our time, Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, Arwahuna lahu al Fida. اللهم صل على محمد and secondly goes to our great scholars our maraji and thirdly to all of you brothers and sisters the lovers and the followers of ahl al-bayt on this auspicious occasion that marks the birth anniversary of sayyida zainab alayha salatu was salam اللهم صل على محمد the verse i've chosen for tonight this course is from Surah Al-Nahl, verse 97, where Allah wa Taala talks about male and female in terms of doing good deeds and good actions. The verse goes like this before we look at the stages of our examination. Allah wa Taala said, "Man amila salihan min zakarin aw unfa wa huwa mu'min falanuhiyannahu hayatan tayyiba." Whoever does good deeds or good action, whether male or female, on condition that that male or female is a believer, Allah said, we will bless that person with the best of life. And here when Allah talks about the best of life, Allah is talking about peace, tranquility, and sukun in the heart. So therefore, departing from this verse of glorious Quran, the topic of our discourse of tonight will be to be pleased with Allah. And the stages of our examination will be three stages. The first stage, we look at the three main factors that shape the life of each and every individual. Whether Muslim or non-Muslim, there are three factors that shape our life. If we understand these three factors and we make good use of these factors, our destiny will be a good destiny. That's number one stage. Number two stage, we will look at how do we become pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereby we will look at the life of Sayyida Zainab alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. In our last stage, we will look at the traces of being pleased with Allah in the life of Bibi Zainab alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The first stage is what are the three factors that shape the life of every individual? Whether Muslim or non-Muslim, psychologists mention these factors. And if you come to Islamic teachings, these factors are also sanctioned and condoned through the teachings of Islam. 
that these three factors shape the life of every individual. You want to become a better person. You want your destiny with Allah to become a good destiny. Look at these three factors. You want your son or your daughter to become the best of children, to become the lovers and the followers of Al al Bayt. We look at these three factors. So we're going to explain these three factors and then we'll look at these three factors also in the life of Bibi Zainab alayhi salatu wasalam. One of these three factors is tarbiya, upbringing. And the second one is eratha, inheritance, where you inherit certain characters and behaviors from either your father or your mother. And the third one is muhit, bi'a, the environment. These three factors, look at them very well, brothers and sisters. It shapes the life of every individual, whether small or big. The first one is tarbiya. Tarbiya, as we mentioned some time ago, a few weeks ago, is one of the greatest factors that shape the life of every individual. If an individual is given a proper tarbiya, a proper upbringing, that individual becomes the best of individual. But if that individual or that boy or that girl are not given proper terbiya, proper upbringing, either by the father or by the mother, then the child will not be a good child. That's number one. Number two is erafa, whereby a child inherits a behavior from the father or from the mother. And we all know about this thing. Islam mentioned in numerous places. Either in Quran or from the Riwayah of Ahl al-Bayt. Whereby if the father and mother, they are not living good life. Their life is full of haram, full of unlawful things. That will impact and affect the life of their children. A typical example is when you eat something which is haram. Like you drink alcohol. Or you take a substance which is unlawful according to the teachings of Islam. If you go and you make a child, that alcohol will affect the child. So the second factor is erafa, whereby every child coming to this world will come to this world inheriting some characters and behaviors of the parents. Whether good characters or bad characters, all of us, when we came to this world, one way or the other, we have inherited some of the behaviors and the characters of our fathers and our mothers. The third one is muhit, environment, bi'a. The environment where we live and the people we associate with, they impact and affect our behaviors. And when you look at these three factors, you realize that they complement one another. Sometimes you may find a person has inherited a bad behavior from the mother or the father. If a father is hypocrite, the child will learn to become hypocrite. If the father is stingy, miser, the child will learn to be like that. So sometimes you will find we have inherited a wrong behavior. Or our children have inherited wrong behavior. But as I said, some of these factors complement the other. I've come to this world and I've inherited wrong behaviors from either my father or from either my mother or even from my grandmom or my granddad. But I receive a good terbiah after that. Since I receive a good terbiah, that terbiah is capable of changing the inherited factors and behaviors. Maybe they were drinking alcohol, they were not living good life, and out of that they brought me to this world. But when I came to this world, they changed their behaviors, the father and the mother. Oh no, I'm sent to my grandmom or to my uncle and they upbring me in a very good way. That upbringing and terbia is capable of changing that inherited behavior. Sometimes, no. I inherited a very bad behavior from my father and my mom. And number two, I'm not giving good upbringing. Like some of us, we are not giving our children the best of upbringing. We spoil our children. 
when they do haram, we don't have a way of calling them to order. We think if we call them to order, we are being harsh to them. Our daughters don't wear hijab, sometimes we don't bother. Our daughters associate boys and girls doing unless we don't bother. Our young boys and girls, they are smoking a lawful substance. Sometimes you don't bother. You tell the father, say, no, they are young, the time will come. Who we'll tell you it's like that? You need to give tarbiya. So say, for instance, she inherited a wrong behavior. And number two, there is no good tarbiya. Because today, our work is more important than our family. Therefore, we give more time to our work than the time we give to our family. And as a result of that, we sacrifice the tarbiya part of the life of our children. Now, if these two are not there, environment can still change. What is environment? The house environment is a very, very important environment that can change the character of a child. If the house environment is not okay, the school where you send your children. Sometimes when we send our children to schools, as parents, we don't think of the consequences of the behaviors they may get from the school. We are only looking at the academic performance of the school. So therefore, we have to look at environment. The first environment is house. And the second environment is the school. Third environment, madrasa. Fourth environment, France. And France is not only physical France. Social media France can also influence the life of every child. Therefore, when you go back to history, right from the time of our beloved prophet until the time of al al Esma, you realize that there were those who did not inherit a good behavior, but because of good environment, they changed. One of them is Murkal. Murkal, the son of Utba. Utba fought against Imam Amir al muminin but Murkal was ready to die for Ahl al-Bayt, alayhi salatu was salam. He had a wrong terbiya. He inherited a wrong behavior. But because of the environment of Ahl al-Bayt, he changed. Another one is Hanzala, Gasil al-Malaika. Hanzala, when he died, Malaika came and made the ghusl of Hanzala. The father of Hanzala was not good. You cannot even describe his behavior. But because Hanzala has a good environment, the honor of Hanzala is that Allah sent the angel to make the ghusl of Hanzala. So therefore, these three factors, the terbiya, the inherited, and the environment, they play a lot of role in the life of every individual. If you want your daughters and your sons to become the best of daughters and the best of the sons, look at these three factors. If the first one is gone, inherited one, look at the two. Give them proper terbia and then give them good environment. When they are going to an environment where haram is overpowering the halal, try as much as you can to have a way of not making them go in there. If you are going for holidays, and you know this place that I'm going, a lot of haram is taking place. For the sake of your children, don't do. You know Abdullah ibn Ubay? Abdullah ibn Ubay was not a good person. But his son became one of the best person. And Alul Bayt were proud of the son. So therefore, terribia and environment. Now let's come to the life of Sayyidah Zainab. And take all these three factors and place them in the life of Sayyidah Zainab as a lesson for myself and to each and every one of you. Number one, inherited behavior. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam inherited from Amir al muminin and Fatima al-Zahra. Oh. Salli ala Muhammad. So right from the word go, it's not like me and yourself. She inherited one of the best behaviors because the father and the mother are masumin. So you don't expect Sayyidah Zainab to inherit any type of a behavior except a positive and a good behavior. That's number one. Number two, when you come to terbiya, Sayyidah Zainab received one of the best terbiya, one of the best model of upbringing because at one stage of her life, she was under the care of Rasulullah. And then at another stage, she was with Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra. 
And one stage, she was with her brothers, Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein. So, therefore, when you come to Tarbiya, she received one of the best Tarbiya. Number three, the environment, which is very, very important. Where today, most of us, we don't bother about the environment where our children go, where they go to play, who do they associate with. Which, which shopping mall do they go? When they go, what do they do at that shopping, shopping mall? Sometimes we don't bother about this, and this is affecting our children. Now, Sayyidah Zainab salam, had one of the best environments. And the first environment, if you like it, of Sayyidah Zainab is the environment where the Wahai revelation was coming. That was the environment of Quran. And here ulama says the same thing. If you are a father and you are a mother, and every day in your house your child hears nothing except Quran and ibadah, that child will grow in that environment. But if your house is always music, it's always unnecessary stuff, the child will grow like that. Zainab alayhi salatu was salam. As we celebrate her birthday tonight, she was brought up in an environment where malaika were coming. Therefore, we have riwaya for 40 days. One riwaya said six months. Another riwaya said nine months. Rasulullah would go to the door of Amir al muminin and he would repeat, Assalamu alaikum, ya ahla bayt al nubuwa, wa mawdi al risala, wa muqtala fil malaika. Six months, nine months. That's the environment within which Zainab was brought up. You must understand there's no miracle that will happen if you don't make an effort in bringing your children. And today's world is the most difficult world we are living in. Let your house become like the environment of Sayyidah Zainab, whereby you play a lot of Quran. Number two environment of Zainab, if you like it. This is where the whole concept of Kisa happened. Hadith al Kisa. It happened in that house of Sayyidah Zainab when she was young. And that is the environment. Number three, if you like it. Surah al ata al insan Surah Al-Insan. It was revealed in that house where Zainab alayhi salam was. So when you look at all this environment, you realize that Zainab alayhi salatu was salam, in terms of inherited attitude in terms of terbia and in terms of environment Zainab was okay and this is how we should also try as parents as fathers as mothers as those who aspire to become fathers and mothers to bring our children because Rasulullah said we all know kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun today you find some of our children they smoke glue glue you ask them why some of our children they chew mira. You ask him why? I said, My father has been chewing. This is the reality we are faced with. Bangi, you name them. So, what environment are you providing to your children and daughters? You find people, you ask them why you watch this type of a film. He said, No, it's just to pass time. Your child is also passing time like that. So Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salatu was salam, we need to emulate and learn from her. So number one stage is these three factors which I wanted to explain. Now let's come to the second stage which is very important. The second stage is how do we become pleased with Allah? Because most of us, we are not pleased with Allah. You know, if you are pleased with Allah, you are ready to sacrifice for Allah. The immediate consequence of being pleased with Allah is that you are ready to sacrifice for Allah. But whenever a person thinks twice in sacrifice or whatever, it may be your knowledge, it may be your wealth, it may be yourself for Allah, it means you are not pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Islam says, the highest value in the life of every individual is to be pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at Quran. Allah said, There are those that Allah is pleased with them and they are also pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see Rasulullah when he went to Asra and Mi'raj. That journey of Mi'raj. We have a riwaya where Rasulullah asked Allah, which of the deeds are the best of all the deeds? 
Then reply came to Rasulullah from Allah. At-tawakkul ala Allah wa rida billah. Is to trust in Allah and to be pleased with Allah. This is the best of all this and the best of all actions. You trust in Allah, you are pleased with Allah. And when I talk of being pleased with Allah, with whatever situation you find yourself, be pleased with Allah. Look at Abba Abdullah. Abba Abdullah, when they killed Ali Asghar, he said, Ilahi, ridam bi kadaik wa tasliman li amrik. Oh Allah, I'm pleased with your verdict. The verdict is that Ali Asghar is gone. What a slim al And I am ready to succumb and give myself to your order and to your command, ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now the question is, if we are pleased with Allah, is Allah pleased with us? Because sometimes you may be pleased with Allah, but how do you know if Allah is pleased with you? Because Allah described those that they are pleased with him and is pleased with them by saying, Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya. Radiya mardiya. Radiya means that soul is pleased with Allah. Mardiya, Allah is pleased with that soul. So now how do we know if Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is pleased with us? Because when you look at the life of some of the companions of our beloved Imam, you realize that those companions, they were pleased with Allah and Allah was pleased with them. One of them is Zul Jabadin. You know, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Mas'ud, rada, he reported, he said one day when we came back from the battle of Tabuk, we came and we found a janaza. And I saw Rasulullah participating in that. I want you to listen very carefully. Before we learn to say the Zainab, to learn how to be pleased with Allah and be satisfied with the little given to us by Allah and stop complaining and be happy with whatever given to you by Allah. Whatever situation you find yourself, be pleased with it and Allah will increase you. Now, Ibn Mas'ud said when we came back, Rasulullah went to this janazah. He said, all of a sudden, I saw Rasulullah, he was placing his hand in the kafan and rubbing the kafan and removing the hand, placing it again, rub it on kafan, remove it. And I didn't understand what he was doing. Then all of a sudden, Rasulullah went down inside the grave and will place his hand in the grave and will come out and will go again before he was buried. Then I asked Rasulullah, look at this. Why are you doing this, Ya Rasulullah? Then Rasulullah raised up his hand and made dua. Allahumma inni amsaytu radiyan anhu farda anhu. Ya Allah, this afternoon that I'm witnessing, I am pleased with Zul Jabadin. I want you, Allah, to be pleased with him. So if Rasulullah is pleased with you, definitely Allah also will be pleased with you. Let me give you another example before we go to Sayyidah Zainab. You know, during the lifetime of our eighth Imam, there was one of his companions by the Yunus Ibn Abdul Rahman. People hated Yunus. You know, sometimes you find yourself in the community, everybody hates you in the community. Yunus, to such an extent, people used to question his birth. So this should console you if you think everybody hates you. Allah love you are. They would hate him, they would speak bad about him. Every corner caucus is about him. But now one day they all came together. Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha was there and Yunus was there. Then Imam asked them, what do you say about Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman? Then one of them started, no, this is like this, it's like that, it's like that. Then Imam said, inni radin an Yunus, fa as'alullah an yarda an I am pleased with Yunus and I ask Allah to be pleased with him. So sometimes you may think everybody is pleased with you. Whereas to find out Allah is not pleased with you. So therefore the question I ask, if we are pleased with Allah, is Allah pleased with us? And the same thing you find during the lifetime of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen approached Hijr 
and he asked Hijr, what will you do Hijr if people ask you to distance yourself from me? Then he said to Amir, Wallah, if they will chop me into pieces and put me in fire for me to be burnt, and then I'm given another life, and they do the same thing, and they continue to do that, I will never distance myself from you, Amir al muminin Then Imam said, Fashhada anni radin ank. You must bear witness, Hijr, that I, Ali, is pleased with you. Now question. How do you know if Allah and Ali al-Bayt are pleased with you? There are three things. Check in your life. If these three things are there in your life, then these are the signs that Allah is pleased with you. But if these three things are not there in your life, then it's a problem. Number one, he said, Al-Zimuhu thalatha khisalin. Shukran la yukhalituhu anadam. Number one, if you are always grateful. You find yourself, if you are grateful, whatever you have, you are grateful. That shows Allah is pleased with you. But Rasulullah never said, he didn't say only shukur. He said, la yukhalituhu. A shukur which is not together with sinning. You say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and you go and you do something against Allah. It means Allah is not pleased with you. Whoever insists on a sin, Allah Ta'ala is not pleased with him. So the first thing is, you have to be grateful to Allah. Once you realize you are grateful to Allah, and you continue to be grateful to Allah, how many of us, we complain too much? Everything we complain. We don't have time to raise our hand and say, Allah, we thank you. Rasulullah said, if you want to know if Allah is pleased with you, look at yourself if you are grateful or ungrateful. That's number one. Number two, he says, Zikrun la yukhalituhu nisyan. Always you remember Allah and you never forget remembering Allah. And the highest form of remembering Allah is recitation of Quran. Some of us, we hardly recite Quran. Some at least they recite once in the month of Ramadan. And some even Ramadan come, they will not recite. The masjid will make a plan for them, they will not still attend. Quran the dhikr Allah mentioned. Bali Ladina Kafaru fi Izzatin washika. Allah said the highest form of remembrance dhikr is Quran. So Rasulullah said, if you want to see that Allah, because you know reciting Quran means you want Allah to talk to you. So therefore if you recite Quran constantly, it means Allah is pleased with you. So he want to talk to you every day. It is tawfiq you need brothers. Muslims, we hardly recite Quran. And the last one, Rasulullah said, wa mahabbatun la yu'athira ala mahabbati. A love of Allah, whereby no love will erase it and delete it. How many times your love and your interest and that of al bayt clash and you take yours and ignore that of al bayt How many times? I don't want to give you an example. How many times your interest, that of al bayt you crush that of al bayt you take yours. So Rasulullah said, if you want to see that Allah is pleased with you, what do you see? You realize that always that of Allah is before yours. Allah comes first before yours. You prioritize things by, in such a way that always is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how Quran gave a lot of example of the people who are mutadayini, religious people. Religious people are the only people who are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with them. And if I talk of religious people, it's not everybody who is religious by the way. Example of a religious people is the wife of Fir'aun Asiya. When they put her in a fire and she knows there was a problem, she said, Rabbi Bnili in the Kabaitan fil Jannah. Oh Allah, build me by your side a house in Jannah. This is what Allah, the same thing, the one who is pleased with Allah and his mutadayyan is Mu'min Ali Yaseen. Kale ya layta kawmi ya'lamun bima ghafara li rabbi wa ja'alani minal mukramin. 
The people he called them Ali Yasin come to Allah, they refused. He said they were punishing him. When he was about to leave this world, he said, I wish my people know what I'm talking to them. The forgiveness of my Lord that I receive is amazing. And the same thing, Qutil Ashabul Uqdud, Allah mentioned in Quran. Ashabul Uqdud, their children, their women were slain. Then Allah mentioned in Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفٍ Among people, there are those who worship Allah only on their tongues. They come like worshippers of Allah, nothing in their lives. It's the only words of mouth. Then Allah said, If you examine them with a lot of easiness, it ma anno biha. They become so much happy. But if you examine them with a little bit of difficulties, in kalawa ala akibai, they will leave the course of Allah. Then Allah said, Khasira dunya wal akhira. They will lose dunya and akhira. Now let's come to the life of Zainab. Let us look at the traces of being pleased with Allah in the life of Bibi Zainab. And this should serve as a lesson to all of us. And you know, history didn't do well when it comes to the life of Bibi Zainab. History did a lot of injustice to the life of Bibi Zainab and to the life of some of our Imams. Because when you read history, you realize that the life of Zainab was not that explained much except only Karbala and beyond. We don't have much of information when it comes to before Karbala. We know she spent how many years with Rasul, with Imam Amir in Iraq, but that's enough. So history did a lot of injustice with the life of Sayyida Zainab. Therefore you realize there is a doctora, a lady, by the name Dr. Aisha from Egypt, a great scholar, lady in Quran and Hadith. She wrote a book, and in that book, she gave the title Zainab Kaharamanatul Karbala. Zainab, the hero of Karbala. And then in that book, she explained, she said, when you look at the life of Fatima to Zahra, you should know that second to Fatima to Zahra is Zainab. The same thing when you come to Maruhuma Mamakani. Maruhuma Mamakani was one of the great scholars. Maruhuma Mamakani, he wrote a book about Rijal. Rijal means man of Hadith. But in that book, he, he dedicated one section about Ahwal and Nisa, the situation of women. When he reached there, he dedicated a place about Zainab. He said, do you want to know who is Zainab in that book? Then he said, I want to introduce you to Zainab. This is a lady that Imam Hussein, on the night of Ashura, he said to her, Zainab, don't forget me in your dua. Imam Hussein said, Latin Sani, fi dua. Zainab, don't forget me in your Salatul Layl. Aba Abdullah requesting Zainab for dua. That tells you the position of Zainab, alayhi salatu was salam. He said, if you want to know Zainab, this is a lady that Imam Zain al-Abdin said, a teacher or a scholar without a teacher. When you come to her life, look at her dedication and how she was pleased with Allah. When Imam al Hussein was holding Ali Asghar, now, they shot the arrow on the neck of the baby. And the arrow got stuck on the neck of the baby. When Imam Hussein was coming, who came and faced Imam Hussein? It was Zainab alayhi salatu was salam. Therefore, scholars said when he came to be this final well with the baby, he did not call anyone. He called Zainab. He said, Atini waladiya sagir, hatta ukabbilahu wa uwadda. Zainab, give me that, my small baby, so that I would kiss him and bid my farewell. Yes, scholar said, Zainab, she has reached that stage of yakin and certainty. And she know there is no life after Hussein. Therefore, whatever you give to Hussein, Hussein will be pleased with you, and Allah will be pleased with you. 
Therefore, Zainab, what she did, she brought Ali Asgar to Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. This one of the traits to say she was pleased with Allah and she wanted to be pleased also with the Imam of her time and who was Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Number two traits in the life of Sayyida Zainab alayhi salatu wasalam. Not only Ali yun al Asgar. You realize. Bibi Zainab, when Imam Hussein was going to the battlefield, she was the only one who kept following behind Imam Hussein. And she was saying, Mahlan, Mahlan, Yabna Zahra. Slowly, slowly, oh, the son of Zahra. Here, when the scholars analyzed this point, they said, because she was pleased with the Imam of her time and she was pleased with Allah. She realized that staying in the Khaimaga will not give her that satisfaction, but to go out to the Imam of her time. And the same to realize when Imam Hussein was in the battlefield, who went there and stood by Talla Zainab when you go to Karbala, you see, it was Zainab alone. That shows that she was pleased with Allah and she was ready to give everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when she went there, she tempted, Wa Muhammad, Wa Aliyah. Scholars here, they mention that that shows how she was pleased with Allah and she was ready to sacrifice everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you like, every Mataya whom Imam Hussein would carry the first person he would meet would be Zainab. When Abba Abdullah was carrying Qasim, Zainab was the first person to meet Abba Abdullah. Therefore, scholars said, day of Ashura was Zainab, and night of Ashura was Zainab. But there is one place where history did not say Zainab was there. That was when she lost to Muhammad and Aum. She never came to receive them from Abba Abdullah. That tells us how Zainab was pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, brothers and sisters, when we claim to be the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt, to love Ahl al-Bayt is to sacrifice for Allah to be pleased with you. If you cannot sacrifice, and you always want to be in your comfort zone, Allah will not be pleased with you. And Zainab alayhi salatu wassalam taught us through sacrifice, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala will be pleased with us. And therefore, in conclusion, we mention, if you want Allah to be pleased with you, you have to strive in your own way. Try as much as you can. Do what Allah wants and stay away from what that Allah doesn't want. As you do that, Allah mentioned in Quran, يُحِبُّونَهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُمْ They love Allah and Allah love them. And if you love Allah, Allah show you that love. But if you love Ahl al-Bayt and you are not ready to sacrifice for the cause of Ahl al-Bayt, then that your love is not love, brothers. That love will not be considered a love. In conclusion, I show you this one rewire which happened in the house of Amir al-Mu'minin, would say the Zainab alayhi salatu was salam. You know, Zainab, daughter of Imam Amir. Imam used to teach all the companions who would come to Imam, Imam would teach them. But now one day, Imam came and found Zainab. She was teaching the ladies. Everything they would ask from Quran, Zainab would respond to them. Imam Amir looked at Zainab and he said to Zainab, Indeed, Zainab, you have inherited from us. So, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have a rule towards our children. Impart that knowledge of Ahl al Bayt. Today, we were in Dar es Salaam, somebody was telling us, when you look at how many hours our children spend in madrasa compared to the hours our children spend in school. It's a shame on us. It's not acceptable for the lovers and followers of our Lord. School, we need it. Because that's about life of dunya. We need it, no doubt. It's must. 
but don't forget Akhira. Imam Amir al said, you have inherited from us Zainab. So what are you making sure your children will inherit from you? Laziness of not performing Salat on time, not taking them to Madrasa on time, not attending to Madrasa meeting on time, not listening to what the school is telling them on time. All these things will impact on the life of the children indirectly. So let's try, brothers, and let our children inherit from us the best of attitudes and the best of behavior. And lastly, lastly, somebody asked Imam Zain al Abidin after Karbala, I want you to take note of this. Are you successful? You know that line, you're successful. Mom said, wait for the Azan to come. But there was another question. Who made you successful? He said, Allah and my auntie Zainab. Many scholars try to give sharah interpretation of these points. Some said because she did not say I am the leader, so I'm going to allow the flocks to go. She would rather go and the rest will follow her. So a lesson to I and you, if you are a leader, when there is something, you start before others come. It's what we learn from Zainab Imam Zainab said, Allah and Zainab, and it's true. Without Zainab, there was not going to be any Karbala. But today, look, it's the birth of Zainab, and how many people attend to the birth and visit of Zainab. But without Zainab, there is no Muharram which you come every night and spend your wealth. So we ask Allah wa ta'ala to inspire us with the life of Sayyidah Zainab. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen us to emulate the life of Sayyidah Zainab. We ask Allah to forgive us our shortcomings in the right of Sayyidah Zainab. Because no doubt we are all at fault when it comes to the legacy of this lady. We are not doing justice, including me, Wallahi al -Azim. To the life of Zainab. History did injustice. And the Alavis are continuing to do injustice. Because we don't enliven people about her life. You find Muharram, some of our ladies come cry, 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 cry. And they don't wear hijab. That is injustice to the life of Zainab. Husband, wife, no hijab. He keeps quiet. He's smiling. Injustice to the life of Zainab. I'm not joking. This is the reality. Because she protected hijab. So therefore we are all at fault when it comes to the life of this lady. Husband walking out with his wife and she's not hijab and he's happy smiling. As if nothing is happening. It means you have not understood Zainab alayhi salatu was salam. When Zainab stood in front of Yazid to protect the face veil. So therefore let's all make efforts. To emulate them in a true sense of emulating them. Not where it is okay for you come, gum, gum, you cry for Zainab, and in your life there is no Zainab in your life. You rather don't cry and don't wear the black, let your life be seen Zainab alayhi salatu was salam. Because that is hypocrisy. So we ask Allah wa ta'ala to forgive us, inshallah. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to expedite the reappearance of the Imam of our time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the world is going through a lot of situations, a lot of turmoil, especially in Iraq. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to bring solution to the problem of this world, insha'Allah. Through the barakat of the birth and adversity of this lady, we ask Allah azza wa jalla to bring peace and justice to the world, insha'Allah. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallillahumma ala muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. Allah.